Welcome to part three. Uh, there were a couple of things that are in Stickle's summary that are not addressed in either Wyatt or Earl's analysis. One of them was brought to my attention in the comments section of one of my previous videos. What about the severed tree root? This particular piece of tunnel evidence is brought up in Stickle's summary as well as Summit's article and Gunderson's videos. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, Stickle's uh, summary and uh, it's a little hard to follow. I'll go slow. Bear with me. Okay, from Stickle. The profile was also demarcated by severed tree roots, the significance of which was described by professional tree surgeon Jerry Hobbs. Running under the foundation from south to north was a large root which had been chopped off at the edge of where a, the large amount of cans, bottles, and plastic were being found. A growing root would had to have had run in and through the cans and bottles, but did not. The root, some three inches in diameter, had been severed with a handsaw about 90% through, then pulled off, peeling the bark off the root. The peeled layer of the cambium layer had been well-established healing already in process. New feeder roots had started to grow from the cut portion of the root and attained lengths of 6 to 15 inches. A space of 59 inches to the north the roots pick up again. Only these had been chopped off from the larger root and were dead. The dead root was about one and a half inches in diameter and the rest of the woody part of the root, indicating it was probably severed at the same time as the green root that was attached to the tree was severed. Both the feeder root lengths and the healing of the cambium layer indicates that the root had been cut at the same time of four to six years earlier. I feel that my determination is accurate due to my experience of the planting and removal and care of some of the same kind of trees for more than 25 years. To me, this is conclusive that with the inconsistent soil area, the plastic bag dated 1982, and the old bottles, cans, and debris were put in the ground after 1982, and it was not an old dump site as it appeared. So that's uh, Jerry Hobbs and the severed root. Notice in the introductory sentence states severed roots, plural, and then goes on to describe one and only one severed root roots. Uh, the uh, singular plural agreement is inconsistent throughout uh, Hobbes' analysis. And uh, notice that uh, before the dig, Hobbes was a professional gold miner and prospector. And now all of a sudden he turns into a professional tree surgeon. Uh, his claim that the root had to have run in and through the cans and bottles is unsubstantiated. Uh, do we know what the growth rate of this kind of root is? No. Uh, where was it in relation to the cans and bottles? We don't know. Where was it in relationship to the plastic bag? We don't know. How did he determine that it was a cut with a handsaw? Uh, what does he mean uh, by the same kind of trees? Does that mean the same species of trees or similar species or are all trees that grow roots of the same kind? How does planting, caring for, and removal of trees make him feel accurate in determining the time of the cut in the root? I'm not convinced of Hobbes' tree expertise. Why did we not get a second opinion? There is nothing like convincing evidence here to determine that the fill and debris was placed in the area after 1982 or that it is not a trash dump. If the roots, plural, which is exactly what we would see if these tunnels areas were kept open until four to six years earlier, then uh, how does this root compare to the other severed roots, if there are any other severed roots? 
actually uh, all of the years of experience I have in woodworking and antique restoration would make me feel fairly confident in determining how and approximately when such a thing was cut off if I were able to look at it. But I would not presume to have the final word on it without at least one other opinion. Okay, there's another issue in Stickle's summary. Uh, neither Earl nor Wyatt addressed it, and here's from Stickle again. In addition to discoveries underground, there were observations within the building itself which remained unexplained. A stack of 20 or more unused light brown asphalt tile appearing to be exactly the same tile used throughout the entire interior floor of the preschool was discovered in the cupboard under the kitchenette sink in the office. This discovery raised the question of whether or not the floor had been patched, or perhaps replaced in its entirety. Several sections of tile had been removed by the district attorney's investigators in 1985, but the blast black mastic under the tile remained on the concrete slab. In order to check the preschool floor thoroughly for any patches or replaced areas of concrete, all of the tile would have to be removed and the mastic would have to be sandblasted or chemically removed. Because of financial and time constraints, these ideas were quickly abandoned in favor of trying to locate and identify any tunnels or rooms under the school. Uh, <laughs> okay, leftover tile. Uh, is that suspicious? Okay, anyone, uh, anytime one does a tiling job, one is wise to overestimate the number of tiles that one would need for the job in order to accommodate for the possible breaking or damage of the tile during installation. Saving the tile rather than throwing it out is wise so that you can have tiles to replace one if it gets damaged. Is that more likely or does everyone who has extra tile stored keep it around specifically so that they can use it to conceal patched up secret trap doors? What is more likely? Also, the claim that they didn't have the time and money to get all of the tile and adhesive up in order to thoroughly examine the concrete for patches is bullshit. Get a crew in there with hefty scrapers and a strong solvent to get the tiles up, then a floor sander with 40 grit paper to get the black mastic up, and an area the size of a gymnasium could be cleared in four to six hours. Stickle's crew was on site for 23 days. I think they didn't bother with attempting to find evidence of trap doors because the prior investigation into the matter was sufficient to determine that there were not. Finding more evidence that there were no tunnels was not what they were hired to do. They knew that they were better off composing a list of criteria that was so open that no matter what they found down there, it would meet those criteria. So, why was Stickle's report rejected as evidence in court of law? Well, maybe it had something to do with the fact that after digging under a building and finding clear, conclusive, verifiable evidence that it was used as a garbage dump, he concluded that there were tunnels there that were used for ritual abuse of children by a well-concealed group of satanic cult members who managed to fill those tunnels completely with several thousands of cubic feet of soil containing a sundry of trash items of an appropriate age to give the illusion of a random assortment of discarded household things, and they were able to accomplish this without being detected by any outside source, even though that they were accused of what was probably the most high-profile and extreme sexual abuse case in history, and Stickle's underground tunnel hypothesis that had absolutely no historical precedent was presented as being more logical and scientific than an alternative explanation that has been a known and common occurrence in subterranean explanations. Uh, that uh, might be it. Uh, as I stated in the beginning, this analysis is narrowed down to one and only uh, one issue within the McMartin preschool case. From this, I cannot conclude the innocence of the accused. I can only conclude that if Ray Bucky and Virginia McMartin were guilty of doing anything, they weren't doing it in tunnels below the school building. Gary Stickle is guilty of producing what may be the stupid, stupidest archaeological report in history. 
Apply Oakham's razor. The simplest explanation is a trash dump. The law of falsifiability. One has to wonder what that crew would have had to encounter to determine that there were no tunnels. No matter what was down there, they would have made it into evidence of tunnels. The principle of parsimony. Don't include extraneous variables that require further explanation. Like, where did the defendants get the fill? Where did they get the artifacts? How did they achieve access to the underground spaces? And so on. If Stickle's report had been entered as evidence, the prosecuting attorneys would have been gigafucked all the way to Jupiter. It would have been made the trial more of a circus than it already was and added a dozen more accusations that would require evidence for which there was none. The prosecution would have cursed the day that Stickle was born and they would have wanted his nuts in the nut grinder. They really didn't think this through, did they?